Well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad that uh, you're joining me tonight. And we're going to get into the second part of giving as we see it in the New Testament. Very important part of our lives as believers today. So as we get into this, let me remind you of several areas that we've looked to in the scripture. Uh, they have been, first and foremost, the idea of being a good steward of God's money and we looked at the unjust steward who figured out how to salvage a job when he didn't do a good job for his boss. Jesus said to make friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. And then the next time we looked at four areas that affect every part of our lives when it comes to finances. It is our income, our expenses, our saving, and our giving. Our income is something that we will always work on our entire lives. That's just the way it goes. We do, uh, we learn skills, we do uh, different parts of our jobs. Uh, we gain more experience, hopefully with gaining more experience or taking some more classes. We gain the trust of our employer or we make a way for us to gain more income. And that's something that we work on for many, many years of our working lives. Our expenses are the quickest way to help with stress in our money situation. Uh, a lot of times there's stress that comes because of money, uh, because of uh, things didn't go the way we thought it would. The quickest way to help some stress is to get a hold of your expenses and to cut your expenses. That's the quickest way to do that. Doesn't mean you won't have to continue to whittle that down. It doesn't mean it'll alleviate all stress, but it is the quickest way to alleviate some stress about finances in your life. Then we looked at the area of saving. Saving money is important. We save for the future. We save for goals that can be not immediate, but they're not long-term per se need a car, you need to repair a car, uh, you, you need to buy some equipment, you need to buy a computer for work. Those things are not cheap, and so you save for those uh, not immediate needs, but they're not long-term either. So you save for those areas of life, and you save for long-term retirement. Uh, that's something that takes initiative. That takes something, that's something that takes discipline. And then you also need to save for an emergency. This is a great time. The reason I'm even going through the finances like this is because of the shutdown that we've experienced in our country that has really closed our economy. People are furloughed. People are uh, losing jobs. Uh, it's a mess out there. Uh, I I'm, I'm, know that some of our folks have gone through some downsizing Boy, I'd watch the news almost every day, and I hear of the airlines. I believe it was American that has lost two-plus billion, with a B as in boy, billion dollars. Uh, Southwest has lost over $90 million. I saw a hotel chain that just let go of 1,300 workers, a big hotel chain, and they're also cutting back on salaries of all the workers that are staying. I saw that a gym down in Phoenix, that they were, uh, because of the cleaning, because of the virus, that they're upping their prices. They're staggering how many clients can come into the gym at any one time, how long they can be there. They're cleaning in the middle of the day, a lot of things like that. And so with the shutdown, people are losing jobs. And so this is the easiest way to help uh, with that is if you'll save for those emergencies. This is a great time to look at your finances and say, okay, this is where I wanted to be. Where can I be the next time this may happen? It's important to think about that. Then we started talking about giving. And last week we looked at giving is part one, and it was Old Testament giving. Old Testament giving was really framed in the idea of a tithe, tithe 10%. And remember the Jewish people, 
had the tithe in the land when they got there. That was an ongoing thing. Got in the land, they began to work the land. There was another 10%. That's 20% every year. And then every third year, they were to give another 10th of other areas of life. And then they had the tithe that was with the animals and, and all those different uh, parts of their life as it worked in the, all the ways of their life. It was, as some probably would say, it might have been a tax, but it was a way that God's people, the Israelites, were to take care of those Israelites, the Levites, the priestly tribe that did not receive an inheritance. It was a way to take care of them. Some maybe begrudgingly gave the money. Some probably gave it with a happy heart, knowing that that was God's plan. So we looked at giving in the Old Testament. That was part one. It was compulsory. Some may have resented it. In fact, knowing the Jewish people and seeing what we read in the book of Haggai uh, and in the book of Malachi, uh, those prophets had to get after them about not taking care of bringing the tithes into the storehouse. Specifically, the storehouse was the temple. It was nothing else. It's nothing else in the New Testament either. The storehouse was the temple. They were to bring their tithes to the storehouse. And when they didn't do that, when they didn't trust God, they robbed God. And God made it as though their monies would fritter away. It was like they had holes in their pockets. So that's what we looked at with part one. Now, part two tonight of giving. And we'll get to our text now. So part two of giving. So giving, New Testament giving, part two here, the Bible says, and the Lord Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That is so true of our lives. Where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. A few years ago, we were having a missions conference, and I'm digging my wallet out of my back pocket here. During the missions conference, the pe preacher that was preaching for us was talking about our attitude and about giving. This is an illustration that I have never forgotten. In fact, our folks know it so well because I've shown it so many times, but it is so true. Where my treasure is, that's where my heart's going to go. We think that, you know, that oftentimes that, uh, well, uh, we will kind of, uh, we'll change a heart and, uh, that's where we'll put our money. Uh, the fact is, is where the treasure is, our heart's going to gravitate toward that. And he says, oftentimes we take, and he uses his wallet as an illustration, he threw it over there on the communion table like that. And he says, you know, oftentimes we think that I'll aim my heart over here. I'll aim my heart over there. I, I, I'll go this direction. He says, the fact is, it's just like the magnet pointing north. He says, where our treasure is, that's where my heart is going to go. It's going to go right there to that, to that money. That's how it works in our lives. And that's what the Lord uh, is trying to get across to us here. So where my heart is, where my treasure is, that's where my heart will be. When I was a youth pastor, uh, this would have been about 25, 26 years ago. I was a youth pastor, and there was a young lady that we had been working with. I don't remember how they came to the church. And I'm not trying to pass judgment here, but... This family had been living a hard life. When I met this young girl, this teenager that was wanting to come to camp, it was really because her grandmother wanted us to come to camp because grandmother was raising her. Well, the grandmother had some health problems. Some of those health problems were just living life. Some of them were the life that she lived. Uh, she showed me that she had been attacked. Someone tried tried to kill her. There was a big scar in her neck where she had been stabbed. And uh, she had some health problems. Some were in light of that attack that were on her. Some of it was just the life that she lived. And so now she's raising her granddaughter. She's raising her granddaughter. Her granddaughter had been in and out of trouble. Uh, she had been in and out of the court system, juvenile detention and such. So the grandmother starts coming to church. She brings the granddaughter. She wants the granddaughter to go to camp with us. Okay. Well, that wasn't easy because there was juvenile detention or juvenile records that would prohibit her from going out of state. We were in Texas. We we're going to camp in Tennessee. So there was issues with that. So they asked if I would go and speak to the judge on behalf of this teenage girl. 
Well, that was my first experience doing anything like that. And I went and I talked with the judge about what this camp was, what we do at this camp, the whole purpose, how, when we would leave, how much it would cost, how long we would be there, when we would return, mode of transportation, all the logistics that you have to deal with if someone's in that kind of a situation. So I go talk to the judge, and sure enough, the judge grants uh, that this teenage girl can go to camp with us. Okay. So when that happened, we began to try to help them get their act together. Now, where we go to camp, uh, it's not just a free-for-all at camp. It's very structured. It's structured with several preaching services a day, teenage camps three every day. We'd leave on Saturday evening. We uh, chartered a bus back then. Uh, we left Saturday evening. We got into camp Sunday afternoon. Uh, we got there. Camp started Sunday night. It was all the way through Friday evening after the service Friday night. We got on the bus ride all night, get all the way back home Saturday morning, time for church Sunday. It's very structured. There's a dress code. It's not a free-for-all on how you dress. It's not a free-for-all on mixing and mingling with teenage boys and teenage girls, as they like to do. They sit together in services, they see each other, but it's it's just something that is very controlled. So the judge was pleased with all that, so they're going to come. So we start helping this grandmother and this daughter start coming to camp. Well, as time gets closer to camp, there's a thousand questions. Can she wear this? Can she wear that? Should she bring this? Can she bring that? Uh, should she have this or what kind of bet? I mean, it was it was 100 questions that to me are second nature. But my poor wife answered all of them as best she could. And then after a lot of, and I'm just going to say it, moaning and groaning and whining and crying and, and uh, can't believe that this costs this much and how come we have to do this and why is it we have to spend this and why can't we just do this? After all this, we work our way through it. And by the way, uh, we had a yard sale. We made enough money to pay for charter of the bus to pay for a lot of the uh, uh, camp fees for the kids to go. I think we took 42 people on that trip. And uh, we got there, we had a great time that week, but getting there was tough because it was new for everybody. But this one girl, as we worked through getting her uh, into camp after all of this stuff, and I think some people even gave her some clothes and gave them some money to get all this after all of this, and they couldn't afford this, and they couldn't afford this, and why does it cost this much? She showed up to go to camp with some brand new tennis shoes that even 25 years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, probably would have cost in the neighborhood of $75 to $100. Now, I got to tell you that I just bought a pair of tennis shoes, some new balance tennis shoes. I think I paid $25 to $29 just a few weeks ago on Amazon. And it's been a long time since this. So these shoes were expensive. They were in, not in the early days of when tennis shoes became such a fashion statement. It's so expensive. They'd been around like that for 10 or 15 years or so by then, but good gracious. And in my own polite, kind, very sweet manner, I remember thinking, you got to be kidding me. You have whined and, and cried about everything about going on this trip and you show up with tennis shoes because... Where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. That's the way it works. Let's move on with our PowerPoint here this evening uh, as we do this. And first, I want you to notice that New Testament giving is assumed. The Lord Jesus, when he taught in, in the Gospels, when he taught, he would teach in a manner in which New Testament giving or giving in his day and time, which he was fulfilling the law. So they were still under the Jewish law, the tithe. But in the New Testament, as we roll into this, it is assumed. My brother Lee Music pointed this out when he was teaching through the uh, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So New Testament giving, it is assumed that we're giving. And that's what Jesus said. Now, as we continue on here, Let's notice that Jesus dealt with giving in the Sermon on the Mount. I said that just a moment ago, referencing back when Brother Music taught through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. In this passage of Scripture, this as we are given this passage in Luke 6, Jesus said it this way about giving. Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, 
pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. So Jesus says, look, you give, and it shall be given unto you. So Jesus assumes giving. Jesus assumes giving. I heard a preacher several years ago talk about whenever they're looking for those who would serve in a specific leadership role. At this church, I think they had elders, an elder, deacon, in some sort of leadership role. Uh, that he would first and foremost look to see if they were faithful in attendance to church. Secondly, if they were faithful in giving to church. And he always said, and I was amazed that he said this, he said, but every time I look through this, I'm sufficiently depressed that people are not giving the way they should be giving and trusting God with their money. So Jesus dealt with giving in the Sermon on the Mount. And the New Testament giving is assumed that we are to be givers in our lives. Matthew twenty two twenty one 21 says this, They say unto him, uh, Caesar's, then unto him, render therefore unto Caesar's the thing which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. And I know that's a little bit rough the way it's printed out there with Matthew twenty two twenty one. 21. Jesus is dealing with a group of people that are trying to trick him, trying to trap him with a question. The question was this, Hey, is it right for us to give to pay taxes to Caesar, uh, or should we just pay uh, to the Lord? And the deal was they thought it was mutually exclusive. They thought if you were going to be, uh, you know, if you were going to have any relationship with the Lord, you didn't, you weren't supposed to give to Caesar. And if you uh, were going to give to Caesar, well, you wouldn't be able to give uh, to the Lord. And they, he, they were trying to set him up in a trap that it was mutually exclusive. And Jesus says, look. You, you render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and the God the things that are God's. They're not mutually exclusive. Governments have a role in our lives. It is Old and New Testament truth about governments, and governments will like it. They tax people so that the governments can function. It's always been true. It's true in Jesus' day. It was true before Jesus' day. Uh, and they've always taxed people. That's the way it is. And we're supposed to give to the Lord and to the Lord's work. So New Testament giving is assumed in our lives. Jesus warned against using the tithe or tithing as a means of righteousness. There was a fella that would show up here at our church for a while. He hasn't been in years now, and I don't know that he, I don't think he was in great health. And it was the most kind of bizarre thing. This fellow would come in long after the service would start, but before the offering would take place. And he would come in and he would sit on the back row. It would only happen in the summer, and it would only happen for three or four or five weeks in the summer. It was very sporadic. It was very erratic the way it would happen. He'd sit in the back row, and he'd wait for the offering plate to come around. The offering plate would come around, and he would put a $50 bill in there. He did it. Every time he came, he would stay for some and sometimes all of the message. But as soon as the message was done, there was no shaking hands. There was no getting to know him. He was out the door. He did leave a welcome card one time, and I was able to follow up with him. It's a very interesting guy. He was a kind of a self-made guy. He made a lot of money. If I remember right, he had some sort of a, a business of, I want to say in a, some big building that he had a flea market or something like that, that he, in other words, that people, vendors would pay him to have a flea market there. In other words, it was his business and he did well. And uh, I, it was a second home here in our area. And so I visited him at his home and he's an interesting guy, but I always got the feeling and I don't know heart, so I can't know his heart. And then uh, I always had the feeling that he was kind of, buying or paying himself off to feel better about what he was doing. Now, that may not have been the case, and that may have been true. There's a preacher that I know just down the road. It's another uh, Baptist church, and he and I were talking. I'd, I'd, run, I'd ran into him, and he and I were talking, and he said, did you ever know, say, he called his name? Yeah. He said, you know, he would come. He would, as soon as our, your service was over or whenever he felt like he could leave, he would come to a beeline, and he would come down to our church and he would put a $50 bill on the plate. 
And it's just so bizarre. Again, I don't know his heart, but it, it just seems so erratic the way he's going about giving and trying to, I don't mean a help or soothe his conscience. I really don't know. I, I'm not the Lord. He'll answer the Lord for that. Not to me. But Jesus warns against using tithing as a means of righteousness. Now, as we look on in our PowerPoint here, Luke 11.42 says this, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe of mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done and not leave the other undone. So Jesus is not saying that you shouldn't tithe. Now, these guys had got it down to a science. When it's talking about mint and rue, and another passage in Matthew talks about anise, the idea is that herb gardens, little herb gardens, they would have outside of their window or in their patio just something to sprinkle on their food or to help the bread to taste better. Herbs, they would they would section off a tenth of it. They were very careful about that, but they didn't care about the love of God and, and the judgment that he's talking about was having the authority and the position to judge a widow who had a real need and maybe throwing a widow into debtor's prison or something of that nature. He says, you got, you got this all wrong, he tells him. He says, you're worried about this whole idea of how much you're giving, is it a tenth? Is it exactly a tenth? Is it $78.32 exactly on the dime about what we're supposed to be giving? If that's what the Lord wants you to give, give that. But they were using that as a means of their righteousness. In Mark 7, 11, But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corbin. That is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And what they were doing in Mark 7 that Jesus was pointing out, it says, look, the passage of Scripture says that you are to honor your father and mother. In the book of Ephesians, Paul says it this way, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. And Jesus was calling out the Pharisees. Now, isn't that interesting? We use the passage of Scripture for little children that they're to honor their father and mother, and they are. They are to obey. They are to do that. But the context that Jesus used here was that as an adult, mom and dad have gotten older, and it was the responsibility of the children to care for their parents as they got on in years. They would calculate what they might have to pay for them, uh, and maybe they would stretch it out over a period of time, or somehow, some way, they had this calculation that they could take the amount of money that they thought that they would pay for it, helping mom and dad in their in their aging years, and they would give that to the temple and say, oh, well, my, I've given the money, mom and dad. I'm sorry, I can't help you. I, I can't be, I can't do what I'm supposed to say. Jesus called them on it. So that was not God's plan. That is not what God wanted you to do. That is not God's plan. And you can't use this idea of tithing or the idea of giving certain amount of money, and that's going to be okay with the Lord. That's not the way it works. So he says, you're worried about all these little details and getting out of taking care of mom and dad. He says, but uh, that's not right. And he called them on it. Luke 18, 11, and 12 says this about two men. There's a great message I heard years ago about two men went to the temple. Two men prayed. Only one man left righteous. And the Bible tells us about this publican and this Pharisee that went to the temple. And both of them went to the temple to pray. And the first one, the Pharisee, stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee. And I could just see this self-righteous man dressed in his regalia, probably has gone over to the giving money box, probably has made a show of how much he's going to be giving over there. And he prayed within himself, and maybe he, he, uh, he was looking up to heaven with his hands raised. And as he does this, maybe he even points over here and he says, look, I thank thee I'm not as other men are extortioners. Probably pointing to the public and the tax collector. Unjust. Maybe he saw Mary Magdalene or somebody like that and knew that she was had been a mess in her life. Adulterers. 
Or even as this publican over here, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like him. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And here's this self-righteous man. The Bible tells us that the publican would not so much as lift his eyes up for heaven, but he beat his breast. And he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Bible tells us two men went to the temple, two men prayed, but only one man left righteous, and it was not the Pharisee. And part of his thinking was that not only did he fast, but he gave tithes. And the New Testament giving doesn't make you righteous because you give. You can't buy your way into heaven. You can't pay enough money and be good enough. That's why they, the disciples were so dumbfounded whenever Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. And the disciples were dumbfounded by this. They couldn't believe it. Lord, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, with men, things are impossible. With God, all things are possible. He didn't say it was impossible. The problem is that men trust money. But giving is not going to make you good enough for righteousness enough. Giving is assumed in the New Testament. It doesn't make you righteous. We give because we have been made righteous. We do not give in order to become righteous. Very important distinction. Now, New Testament giving is a matter of faith. I'm going to have to get into more of this next week, but let's look at this passage of Scripture and we'll be done tonight. Jesus made an example of a poor widow. The whole context here is Jesus is in the temple and he's probably in Jerusalem for the last time. And he spends that last week in and out of Jerusalem and he spends time in and around the temple. He cleanses the temple for the second time. He debates with the, with the uh, Sadducees. He debates with the Herodians. I mentioned them a moment ago when they tried to trap him with a question about giving to Caesar or to God. He deals with the Pharisees. He deals with all these people, and Jesus is in the temple. I can only imagine the scene, and there was a certain place that anybody could come. It was open to anybody, and he could come, and they could do their alms giving, their tithing, if you will. And as Jesus sat there, this is fascinating. The story will really make you think, and let's just look at it together. In Mark 12, 41 through 44, and Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury and many that were rich cast in much. So he's sitting over there and he's watching this parade of people. It's my understanding it was this wooden box. They drilled a hole in it and they, when it was full that they would take it and they would count the money and use it for whatever purposes. But there were guys that would make a show of it. I've often think of a guy trying to shoot a three-point shot in basketball. And these guys wanted this to make a little bit of noise when it hit the, the box. They were making a show. You're supposed to give as a matter between you and the Lord. Verse 42, and there came a certain poor widow. And she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. A mite was a day's wages. Take your wages sometime. Why don't you do this? Why don't you take your wages and why don't you just calculate how much you would make a day? Okay? Calculate that for a day. Whatever it is you make. Once you calculate that for a day, when you calculate that for a day, say, okay, there's 30 days. And back then there were about 30 days. They calculated all the day about 30 days. 30 days in this month. Okay. So I'm going to take two days of wages. And I'm going to give them. Now, maybe you do that. And God bless you if you do. That's between you and the Lord. My point is here, this woman gave two mites. Basically, she gave two uh, days wages. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had even all her living. And Jesus made it a point here to say, look, this widow gave more than all these wealthy guys who gave out of their abundance. Now, it's not wrong to calculate how much you need to live, 
this is how much we need to live. We need to pay our bills. We need to pay our rent, our mortgage. We need to, whatever other bills, with it, our utilities, our car payments, if you have that, whatever it is you have, it is not wrong to calculate that and say, okay, this is how much we ought to give. My point is this, look, it is a matter of assumed, it is assumed in the New Testament that you will give. You can't give your way into righteousness. and It is a matter of faith. This poor widow gave in faith and he gave all that she had and Jesus pointed her out as someone who gave all. And she gave more because she gave everything. How is it with you in giving? Have you made it intentional? Have you made it purposeful? Have you decided to give when you're paid? Have you decided to give even as it is in 1 Corinthians 16 on the first day of the week? You know, my wife and I, uh, we get paid once a month and we give whenever we get paid. That's what we're, we're supposed to do that. And that's what I believe. And so you be intentional about this and we'll get on with more about giving next time. God bless you. I hope that you're thinking through all of these messages about the ideas of money and our relationship to it. It's important because it affects so much of our lives on a daily basis. God bless you. We'll see you next time.